today we're going to read what many upon many have speculated about. And because it is incredibly so rare in Scripture, we won't make definitive judgments on everything. And for those of you who live in the black and white, you may want to stop watching uh, right about now. Because like reality, the Bible isn't always black and white. There's a lot more gray than we truly want to accept. Now, God is good. God is creator and sustainer of all things. God is one in three persons. Jesus is God's only begotten son. Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death. He physically rose from the dead and will return one day to judge the living and the dead. That's all black and white but don't differentiate from that. But also don't make things that are grayer have to be black or white, which tends to be how we become legalistic or self-reliant. And as of today, we are tackling something that is in Scripture. We believe it to be written by the Holy Spirit through Moses, but that doesn't mean we necessarily understand all that it implies or means. We've read a lot of bad news up until this point. Everything was good in chapters 1 and 2, including creation of man and woman, and Scripture says that it was very good for they were made in God's image. But the rejection of God's ideal in chapter 3 led to the fall, and then the birth of two sons, which led to envy and murder in chapter 4, and in chapter 5 we see the bloodline of sin and disobedience and the inherited sin that each new generation was receiving and living in. Today, we're going to see the culmination of what the sin and disobedience had led to and what God was going to do in response. Some of this isn't going to be easy to hear. Some of this is going to create cause for concern. Some of this may make us want to jump to conclusions about Scripture in a way that isn't healthy or faith-based. But we won't skip over passages just because we don't want to teach them or they don't add to the narrative that we want to promote. To take away from Scripture that was inspired by the Holy Spirit is to censor the truth of the Spirit, and we hold God's Word in highest esteem of how God chose to communicate to us through His redemptive plan outlined in His Word. So let's jump in where we left off at the beginning of chapter 6. Verse 1, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them. So it was no longer just males or sons, but both males and females were being born, and now the family tree was about to spread out exponentially. Verse 2, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they, were, and they married any of them that they chose. The sons of God. Okay, here is where interpretation and study are very useful, but unfortunately, we don't always come to a resolution that is agreed by most people. Sons of God is used to address many types of entities in Scripture. Jesus is the Son of God, God, John 3.16. Israel is known as the sons of God, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Angels are pointed to as the sons of God, Job chapter 1, verse 6. And we truly believe that Scripture interprets Scripture at COV. It's a biblical interpretation that we hold very dear. But what happens when Scripture tends to use the same words or phrases for different entities? Do we guess? Do we choose what we like most? Do we use one that is used most often by the same author? All of these are good questions and proper ones to factor in. And sometimes there are differing views that evolve over years of study that change our mind and our interpretation of what a specific passage or verse actually means. But here's the most important thing that we can do is to stay consistent with our view of God. Even when God seems to be more gray than black and white, is God gracious? Absolutely. But does he bring justice against the deserving? Yes, absolutely. And even though these on the surface seem to be conflicting, they're really not at all. We as people tend to have too low a view of God and too high a view of ourselves which leads to our intellect becoming the basis in which we judge God. Let's be real. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, it is said, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God is and will always be smarter than we are. But that doesn't mean we check our logic and reason at the door, but we attempt to search the scriptures. 
with guardrails known as hermeneutics, which really just means rules of interpretation, to attempt to find the most educated meaning of what the passage is attempting to communicate. This goes a lot farther than just what we want it to say or how we feel that day. So back to Genesis, sons of man, used for Jesus in the singular, sons of man was used to describe angels and the nation of Israel, all things that are not necessarily the same thing. And sometimes you have to find meaning from the context, not just before the passage, but the next verses and maybe the next passage. So let's read on verse three. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. Based on what we've been reading and what we will read, the author is communicating just how bad mankind had become. Last week and the week prior, we studied Genesis 4 and Genesis 5, respectively, and chapters that contain genealogies describing who begat who. But it also was a roadmap of where sin and righteousness had proceeded as well in two different bloodlines. Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel. Eventually, Adam then had another son named Seth, who we believe to be the bloodline in which sons of God is referencing. Let me stay with me for a second. Daughters of man, the bloodline of Cain, is what is being contrasted. Are there issues with this view? Yes. Of course there are. There can be arguments against any and everything, but based on study and based on what we have at our fingertips today, I'm going to default to this interpretation because the differing views that tend to be talked about are much more mystic and sound more like Greek mythology than the Bible tends to communicate. Stay with me. Genesis 4 verse 25 says it this way, Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son named and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. As to communicate that Adam's good son, Abel, was replaced with Seth since Cain killed Abel. And so this is what we see as the underlying theme of intention that the author, Moses, who was led by the Holy Spirit to document these words, is communicating. Then we can see that possibly what sons of God is referencing are those who are seen as righteous. Seth's bloodline, the Sethianites, rather than the Cain's bloodline, the Canaanites. And the differing bloodlines are what past theologians like John Calvin and Matthew Henry and R.C. Sproul contend what both sons of God, being Seth's bloodline, and daughters of man, being Cain's bloodline, actually were. So we have this intermarrying from these two differing bloodlines, one that is considered righteous or obedient, and one that has been bred from a murderer and disobedience. And God says in verse 3 that he will not contend with humans forever, just like kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden where they would have lived forever with their sinful nature. So now there are these two interpretations that unfortunately also have arguments against them. God, one interpretation is that God puts a cap on lifespan of humans who are just becoming more and more sinful. Or does he? Most people die before the age of 120 in contemporary times. But what about Abraham who lived to be 175 years old after the flood? Or Isaac who lived to be 180 years old? So that's one interpretation and it has its flaws. The other one is that which often is more acceptable, is that the author's intent was to point out that the flood, in which we're going to study next week, came about 120 years later from when this was being written, wiping out most of mankind because of their sin and their unwillingness to repent or admit any wrongdoing. In verse 11 of chapter 6, we're going to jump ahead a little bit, but we'll study this next week. It says this, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and I I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. That seems kind of extreme, doesn't it? But as we have studied and seen the bloodlines of Cain and humanity, unfortunately, was just getting worse and worse. This assumption that we're born, you and I are born innocent, it get tainted more and more by culture and society over time, 
it's just not consistent with reality. Because even though our culture does affect us, we are born into a sin nature that Adam afforded us. And it's not that if we don't do any bad, we then will be justified. It's that we can't do anything good without the justifier. So back to verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. All right, here we go. Here's another reason I didn't give this passage to anybody else who teaches in our church, because this is hard. It's over and over. There are a bunch of things we have to wrestle with with interpretation. Nephilim. I'll tell you what, people really like to assume and build theologies about God around their assumptions. The Nephilim is not Aragorn and the Rangers of the North from, uh, from the Lord of the Rings book. There are assumptions that these Nephilim are giants, and we get that from the other place that they're spoken about in Numbers chapter 13. It says this, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. They are spread among the Israelites. A bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So who is the Nephilim? Well, they seem to be larger than the average person. So much so that they stand out. Does that make them giants? I don't know. Are they individuals that came from intermarrying between the Sethianites and the Canaanites? I don't know. Are they mystic creatures that have become a thing of legend? I don't know. Actually, I do know. Yes, that's kind of what they've become because people assume things. But considering how they are spoken about in the scriptures, both here in Genesis 6 and also in Numbers chapter 13, but yet they're silent everywhere else in the Bible that out of 23,145 verses in the Bible, two of the verses name these men of renown, I'd contend that knowing or spending all of our time attempting to decipher exactly who or what they were seems to be missing the overarching theme of what the Bible is really all about, which is the redemptive plan of God being manifested through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we as a church emphasize. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, every scripture, you can read what Paul says to Timothy in two ways. That every word that was breathed needs to be completely torn apart and dissected. And this is where some of us land. And yet we miss the forest for the trees. Or maybe we can look at every verse, every phrase, every passage, which creates a narrative that is useful for building up the believer to put into practice God's word. The emphasis of the verse and the passage that we're studying is not about the Nephilim. Even though that is probably where some of our minds go, because we think that maybe God is holding out on us on some special truth that we're yet to realize. But be careful. That's how Mormonism started. And the emphasis and the point that we are studying is that a man was becoming more and more obsessed. He was becoming more enthralled with his sin rather than God. And we see that God was going to put an end to it, both with an event which would tip the scales of righteous versus the disobedient, and as a foreshadowing of what God would ultimately do to bring freedom from sin and righteousness to all who believe. So let's look at where Moses takes us in verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. As Spencer pointed out last week, sin is a virus, not a poison. 
It replicates in its host and then is shared throughout its sphere of influence. And that is exactly what has happened and what is happening through intermarrying of bloodlines, one that was obedient and one that was disobedient, that the disobedient were defined by Cain's jealousy and murdering of his own brother. So much so that as Moses writes, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was evil all of the time. Mankind had been so overtaken by their sin that more grace wasn't going to fix anything. But God had to intervene because man had become man's worst enemy. See, wickedness is the absence of God at work in society. And that had what, that's what had become of his creation, an absence of God's work and glory being acknowledged or seen. In Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, Jesus is speaking to the disciples around a large crowd, and he says this, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. We as a staff studied this very passage this past week, and we talked, a bunch of, uh, we talked about a bunch of ways that these verses can be misinterpreted from the fact that some people think all they have to do is acknowledge that God is real and that acknowledging that he's real makes them justified to how people think that they can say bad things about Jesus, but if they say anything bad about the Holy Spirit, then they'll never be forgiven. Guys, that's a really shallow interpretation of what we just read. Jesus, unfortunately, becomes white noise for so many people. His name, his gospel, his work have become things that people make fun of. Let me ask you this one time. What master do you serve? What master do I serve? What am I supposed to say, Jesus? Rather than the reality of salvation being available. And so if you want to know what blaspheme of the Holy Spirit is, we must look at what the Holy Spirit communicates in his very word. He says it this way in John 16. I have much more to say to you, Jesus says, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Jesus is speaking to his disciples who, just for the record, he would appoint to become apostles and says that when the spirit of truth comes, he'll what? He will guide them in all the truth. Where do you think that truth came from? The very words that we're reading this passage from, the Bible, the Word of God, written by the Spirit of God to reveal the will of God. It's like Jesus is busting an inception within the confines of the very words the Spirit will bring to remembrance to John when this gospel was written down. And the Spirit will not speak on his own. This doesn't mean that he speaks what others feel or what is popular. He only speaks what he hears from who? God the Father and God the Son. And he will glorify who? Jesus. The Spirit points to Jesus. The Spirit glorifies Jesus. Look at the Spirit and what does he do? He points to Jesus. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit being God, is a conduit of truth. The truth who is Jesus, Lagos. He points us to Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. Don't get it twisted. God the Spirit is part of the triune God, but his job is not to make you glorify him. It is the third person of the Trinity's job to open your eyes to the reality that it's all about Jesus, church. And only He, the Holy Spirit, can make it so you can understand that it's all about Jesus eternally. So what is blaspheme of the Holy Spirit? To consistently and continuously reject the Holy Spirit's testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's to reject the truth of Jesus's finished work, 
It's to ignore or disobey or reject the fact that salvation comes in only one name, and that name is Jesus. And don't you assume you'll just receive it later. Every time you ignore or reject the gospel of truth in the person and work of Jesus Christ, your heart gets harder. So if you hear the gospel over and over, and let's be clear, you hear it a lot at Church of the Valley, and you reject or ignore it, be careful. Because even though God is gracious and patient, his grace and patience will run out as you ignore or disobey his truth found in the gospel of grace, in the person and work of Jesus, in which only the Holy Spirit can help you see and understand. So with that in mind, Let's look at the next verse in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, because we're going to need to do some work to understand this. Because once again, if we just read it without any other of the Bible to help us with the meaning, we're going to come to some pretty crazy and heretical understandings of who God really is. Verse 6, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Regretted? What? Or as the King James translation incorrectly translates, it repented the Lord that he had made man. Okay, listen, God is all-knowing. We know that, right? Like he isn't surprised by anything. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, he knew that God, God knew that he would save you. In Isaiah 46 verses 8 through 10, remember this, keep in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? So the conclusion that God was surprised by what man had become or needed to repent from his creation is ridiculous. His omnipotence, his all-knowing nature means he is neither surprised or in need of turning from sin, as we read and have said many a times from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we cannot assume divine sorrow is the same as our human regret. Divine regret is sorrow of what God knew would happen. So then you ask, why would God let any of this happen? And now you're starting to understand that you and I are not God. His ways are not our ways. But in my finite understanding, I'll say what I've been saying all along. The bad news is terrible. It's unthinkable. It's illogical. And yet the bad news accentuates how good the good news of the gospel is. So for every time you might think it's so unfair that God would create us and give us a choice to pursue or reject him. And every time we think that, we can also think it's so unfair that God in his holiness would give a way that any of us could obtain eternal life, not through our actions or our works, but by belief in the perfect one who did for us what we were unable to accomplish for ourselves. Now, I don't expect everyone to understand what I just said or to realize the magnitude of that statement, but we as committed followers of Jesus need to always give the truth of the gospel the benefit of the doubt. We need to assume that God really does know best and is the best that anyone could ever fathom or be in relationship with. God's heart was deeply troubled, not because he was surprised, but because he knew what had to take place was happening in real time. God's heart being deeply troubled shows another side of his character that even though he knew the sin of man and the virus that would replicate within his creation, he still created, he still gave a choice, he still sends his son, and he still draws people through faith to himself. See, the story, the redemptive plan of God is not without peril. 
but this story is redemptive. And as we have studied this passage with tons of words and phrases that get misconstrued and misinterpreted, we have to look at the overarching theme that even though wrath would come upon the earth in the flood, God would save a people, not through their good works, but through their faith that was placed in God. That when the earth had not even seen rain yet, Noah still builds a boat far, far from land or from water. When the people continue to wallow in their wickedness, God decided to just not let it continue. Genesis chapter 6 verse 7, so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. For some, that seems like it escalated pretty quickly. But in reality, God's patience for sin is incredibly gracious and he is long enduring. And yet we are incredibly selfish to expect grace after grace without any actual consequences ever being enacted. We read the Bible like everything happened day after day, but sometimes for hundreds of years, God was patient with man and an entire civilization to the point that he eventually needed to go through with the consequences that he shared he would. We assume grace upon grace, and then not only reject that grace, but demonize the Lord when the grace which he, we have refused runs out. God is patient, but he will not enable our sin. We cannot believe he is both just and gracious if we continue to abuse his grace as a father who only threatens and never punishes. Some of you have heard the story of back in the day when Disneyland was open, it's coming soon, but back in the day when uh, my family and I went to Disneyland, we were waiting in line for a ride and I saw a dad talking to his son. His son was just not listening to him. He was just being bad. And so the dad started to count and the counting went like this, Billy, stop that. Billy, I'm going to count to three. You better get back here by the time I get to three. And so he started to count and he said, one, two, and Billy wasn't changing his mind, continuing to do exactly what he wanted to do. Two and a half, two and three quarters. He then divided something by pi. And you know what happened by the time he got to three? Nothing. Nothing. Now we both know that's terrible parenting. And yet we expect God to do that with us. Why did God wipe away all the people, animals, birds, creatures of the ground? Why the animals? Why the animals that are without souls and innocent in regards to actively sinning? I don't know. Not totally. But what many theologians point out is that animals were given to mankind to be under their care and subject to man's authority. And so when sin had gotten to the point as we noted earlier, that wickedness was the absence of God's work, God in his sovereign authority chose also to wipe out all the animals alongside mankind. But, Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah doesn't exactly have the same ring to it as Spencer's signs last week. But God found favor in Noah. And this Hebrew term meant to bring grace upon someone. Now, I definitely say that God may be grading on a curve here to see something in Noah. Because over the next two weeks, we're going to see that he was not the perfect model citizen. But once again, we bring before you this question, are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Do we enter into a salvation relationship through what we bring to the table? or by God's gracious character and gift? Do our morals prove our earning of grace, or is grace getting what we do not deserve in the person and work of Jesus? Noah finding favor in God's eyes was not about his moral record or ability to earn anything. It was because of his belief and trust and faith in God and what he said, which we will see Noah exercising next week. So church, friends, family, how are you being saved? Is it by faith or is it by works? 
Do you think because you abstain from jumping into some inappropriate conversation with your friends that you are now justified? Friends, we are here to point out one thing and one thing only. Justification only comes by way of Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. For years, I've watched people say the right words. I am saved by grace, through faith, in Christ. But then based on their actions, they communicated that they were saved by their effort, through their ability, in their religion. And that will never, ever satisfy. You will always wonder if you're truly saved. You'll never find peace or rest in the new creation that God offers solely through the work of Jesus Christ offered to you and received through faith in the one who did for you what you were unable to do for yourself. Nothing else but Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected could make you and I right with God. Let me pray for us. Father, I I thank you for the hard passages that myself and others have the ability to unpack, not because we are brilliant or great theologians, but because your spirit rests in us and you help illuminate the things that maybe we haven't seen before through other passages and through the collective uh, spurring one another on towards good works. And Lord, for a passage that was hard and a passage that was difficult, honestly, God, it just felt so timely. And so I thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in me and what I trust that you're going to do in and through the community of Church of the Valley through your word that we studied today. Lord, I pray for those who have chosen to give towards the work of ministry at COV that are giving to you, but through this church. God, I pray that you would use their offering, however they send it, either in person or in the mail or going online. God, I pray, Lord, that you would use it for your glory. And I pray as you use it for your glory that men, women, and children would come into right relationship with you and they'd grow to look more like you because of the work that your spirit's doing within your people. Lord, we are absolutely unable to earn our way. And I thank you, God, that we don't have to earn our way, but by faith expressed in action, we can trust that your son is enough. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.